and welcome to this episode of Between Friends. I'm Eileen Roach, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery, and I'm delighted to be here today. We're going to talk about what to do before you hoop. It's all about those decisions that you make before you even press go. And I see a lot of you are, are joining in, and it's so nice to have you here. Judy Whitaker and Lisa Adams and Becky Munns from Little Elm, Texas. Goodness gracious, we're practically neighbors, right? And Retha, you're up in Wyoming without any wind today. That's good to hear. Good to hear. I know you get some serious wind gusts up there. Um, and hi, Sue Brown, Sue S. Brown from OML Embroidery. So nice to have you here. I loved your small town charm, which we're going to show kabloom in a minute. But first, before we do that, I'd like to welcome my guest, Deborah Jones. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Eileen. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Great to be here. Oh, it's always a joy to you know work with you. We work with each other every day. Deborah is our consumable products manager, and boy, does she bring a wealth of information to that topic for sure. So, so many nice people chiming in. We have Dory Hobson and Judy Warren saying uh, uh, aloha from Hawaii and Esther Hoplin up in Canada. Wow, Phyllis Smith in Maryland. And oh, Sanja Otto in South Africa. It's amazing, huh, Deborah? Oh, it oh. is. It just, it, it's just such a great thing to be able to have the community all right here, uh, so close together, even though we're across the world, literally. Absolutely. And you know, when I first started embroidering, Deborah, I used to look at it like I used to call it a solitary sport. It's something that you did alone in your home. And often your neighbors didn't do it. And even your you know, family members didn't do it. It's just something that you did on your own. And today, I, it's still like that for many of us. But yet here, we join together online. And it's so cool. huh? It, so I cool. love it. I know. I do too. Well, before we get started, Deborah, I always like to show the small town charms because many of these folks that are here are part of the OML gang, you know, they do that so along once a month, Sue Brown leads. So let's go ahead over to uh, my PowerPoint and we'll take a look. Oh, before we do that, I have to, I just have to, a little bit of business. You know, recently our Facebook account was hacked and um, you may have, well, if you ever received a message from us telling you that you won and it looks like this, we're not running any contests. So this is really a scam. So please don't click on it. And in fact, we would appreciate it if you contact Facebook and report it. You can just, you know, apparently there's an easy way to do that on your page and, and then they'll stop all that nonsense, which is really important. So small town charm, you know where we started in January, we were at the quilt shop, right? It comes in a five by seven and a seven by 12. These designs are free for anyone who visits our website, we have a new link for you that makes it so much easier to find. You can see dzgns.com slash small town charm will take you to all of them. In February, it was the sweet shop and uh, oh, so sweet it was, right? So I just love that pink and that navy and white crisp awning, how fun. And then uh, in, in uh, March, it, we went, clothes shopping to the uh, So Chic dress shop. And uh, oh, I, it's adorable. Handbags and a dress form, a chandelier, and a really pretty sign, really pretty sign. But this um, month was April. So we I did a flower shop. Why not, right? And we're all dying for spring. Whether you, you're, wherever you're located is enjoying that already, or you're just, you know, waiting for it to arrive. We're celebrating spring here at Dime. So you have the Blooms shop. And uh, I left some space on the Bloom shop so that you could add some of your own uh, small designs. But first, let's take a look at Beach Mama Flowers. She got her So Chic dress shop done. She chose to do her chandelier in gold metallic thread and a very pretty green dress. So Alicia Gentry, she got her blooms, her flower shop all done. She put a sign on the uh, area next to the door that says special today is tulips. And of course, she put an open sign in the window. 
Beautiful job, Alicia, as always. So lovely. And Sue S. Brown, she did kabloom. Love that. She's going to fill her whole town, which she calls Sueville, with lots of color. And notice she's got some really kind of fun googly eyes there peeking out of that door, that window of the door. Oh, we love that. You really did. A, that's so much fun. Just super cute. Yeah, really nice. Okay, and then Candy Bray, she added a lot of extras, right? Look, she's got a dog in the foreground. She put a welcome mat there. She's got a pot of a potted plant falling, you know, over. She's got a bumblebee and a wreath on the door and a beautiful trellis arch, which might be from last year's um, June door, maybe, but maybe not. I'm just guessing. And then she added a second story that is totally all her own. She's got some variegated thread up there in her pots on the second story and uh, a tree on the right-hand side. Just beautiful. Very well done, Candy Bray. And Seth's Sweets and Stitches. She's going pink, and that is just delightful. But her door, Deborah, look what she did. She, and in her, in her notes, she wrote that she actually used a Mylar balloon to embellish her window. <clears throat> That's a great uh, technique that, you know, we've uh, certainly used a lot of Mylar uh, in the past, and it's a great place to use it as like a substitute for glass. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I kind of went fast. So I'm going to I'm going to back up so we can go back to Candy Bray because she piped in and she said, oh, yes, it is from the June door. So thank you, Candy, for, um, you know, verifying that. And Judy Whitaker Whitaker says your second story is amazing. Yeah. And I, I agree for sure. And, you know, that's, that's really cool. It's kind of almost to me European, you know, because so many uh, uh, European stores, of course, people live above them, but having that second story just kind of uh, gives me that feeling. Right. And, you know, I like how her awning, um, it's just shading all of the busy part of the, the, the building, right? right, where where the blooms are and all of that. So her building is actually larger than the awning, which is, you know, often the way it is. So super cute. And Teresa Stagliano, she loves you. I have two two mice here that I'm flipping back and forth. She loves your doggy. Super cute. Really, it looks cute. like it might be a little min pin, but I can't tell for sure. But it's really cute. A little min pin. A little miniature pincer. That's doggy talk. <laughs> I know. You know, many of you don't know this, but Deborah had um, a past semi career in dog breeding, right? Yeah, well, and showing, and, and right, so. it, was, it was fun. We really just bred to uh, improve the breed. We weren't, <laughs> we weren't in the in the money making business and breeding. Right. But, uh, a lot of fun to. Uh, that was a great hobby uh, as well. Yeah. So, okay, so we'll carry on to what we're doing, right? <laughs> okay, yes. so Seth Sweets and Stitches. I think I have a close up. There we go. So, here you can see the pretty colors that she chose. I love um, it. They're, yeah, really very well done, huh, Deborah? Very, very pleasing. Yeah. And she, tiny little micro floral print for the door. That's appropriate, right? For a sure. flower shop. And, you yeah. know, those, those little micro prints are perfect for. Uh, your 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 uh, small town charm projects. Yes, because you know they are all small, obviously, right? They fit in one hoop. It's a whole building or storefront, and so yeah, you don't want to go too big. But you know, we're really here today to talk all about what you do before you hoop. But our special of the project is. Um, it, I mean, the special of the week is our embroiderer's compass. So uh, I'm going to, uh, oh, let's see, Esther Hoplin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking. She put, um, she put her April one on Instagram and we didn't find it, Esther, but I'll do that after today's broadcast and then we will absolutely include it in next week. So thank you for that reminder for sure. Okay, so Deborah, I know you have some fun things to share because you know, Deborah Jones brings a common sense approach to embroidery, which I have always benefited from trying to think the way you think. I don't often do that. I'm kind of more of a scattered brain. <laughs> <laughs> 
anyway, and Deborah just breaks it down in the simple well, way. Well, I think, you know, Eileen, that I would kind of describe it as, you know, you've got that creative gene and that I don't have as much of. Uh, I have a whole lot more to lean more to the technical side, which, of course, you do. Is You have a, a great technical sense as well. But, you know, I think that my true passion around embroidery is making embroidery that lasts so that, you know, we often give our embroidery away, Eileen, right? As gifts. And so sometimes people will tell me, oh, I used tearaway on that onesie. And I'm like, really? How did it launder? And they say, I don't know. I gave it away. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to show you in when a little later in this uh, Facebook Live some things that I wash and wear and have had for a long time. And the stabilizer choice is what keeps them looking great. That's, that's really awesome. So I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm going to, we have a couple questions. Like Lisa Adams says, I, you know, where do we put these small town charms? So on social media, like on Facebook or on Instagram or on Pinterest, you, when you upload your photo, tag it with hashtag, dime so along and then that's what we search weekly to find the images of your small town charm so that that's how we find it and and when I, when we search they actually all come up you know so i know which ones we've already shown so if you posted yours like our friend posted it on instagram and and i don't i don't have it in my slideshow that doesn't mean that oh you missed your week we'll still find it okay and it's Lisa all one Adams. word, right? Right, yeah. Eileen, dime so along. Right. And Lisa Adams said, she she said, I did that. So Lisa, tell me what social media platform you used and we'll dig in and look harder, okay? You know, we don't control. That's the one thing about that Facebook, and right? You don't have total control over what what comes up. You could do your best to search, but... There is a bit of an algorithm that they feed you. So Lisa, just tell us what social media platform. And then we're gonna, now we're gonna let Deborah get back to. Oh, well, that's okay. I, I, I was just commenting, you know, that um, that it's really kind of a passion of mine to, to do try, you know, everything that I'm going to show today and talk about today really was learned through trial and error. And, <clears throat> you know, I try to, share what I've learned about making things not just look good when they come off of the machine, but yeah. what they, how they look, um, you know, even a year or two years from now after they've been washed and worn and enjoyed, or, you know, not everything gets washed, but, you know, we just want to be sure that our embroidery is uh, what I call serviceable. I know that's not a very sexy word, but something that's going to last uh, yeah. for the life of whatever it's applied to. That's the goal. I agree. You know, we put our heart and soul into these projects and many times, many, many times they're gifts. And so you really don't know how someone's going to care for it, launder it, and what it will look like after a couple of washings. So uh, it can be, you know, very upsetting to see someone wearing a garment that you know maybe you embroidered for them or something and it's not looking anything like you would hope so it's best right. to prepare for best results right right and there are some kind of you know i don't want to call them rules because they're not rules but guidelines that we can follow that we can talk about during this uh time together today and you know eileen i have two ways that we can share i've got a little PowerPoint presentation that I thought I would go through first. It's it's short, uh, but just covers some points. And then I've got some samples that I'd like to show that kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. Perfect. I love that. So why don't you share your PowerPoint and we'll okay. just enjoy that information that you're about to that you're going to share because it she is an expert i'll tell you when i have a question that's who i call so the powerpoint should be there right is that yeah. something that sam's yeah, gonna for some reason it's not showing right now okay let um, me see <laughs> i can always okay Oops. there we go and then if you Wait. and then deborah you just go into presenter mode there on in your powerpoint 
and we'll, well pull that. Well, that's, that's, that's not the correct PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm not sure what has has uh, happened here. Maybe I should just go over to the other computer. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I think the one that was there before was the correct one. This is it. Okay. So is can you? Uh huh. So let me go here. Okay. So we see no show mesh. Okay. It's just not. It's just not the right PowerPoint. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Let me see. All right. Um, okay. Okay. I think we're good here. So let me let me go share. Uh, go into presenter mode on on the presentation mode on this one, and I think we'll be there. Okay. Here we are. Can you see that? Yep. All right. Okay. So this is uh, what we're talking about being on special today. It is the Embroiderer's Compass. And I give three different recommendations on for, for 27 different fabrics. So it's really a wheel and you just dial it to the the fabric you want to embroider. And in the top window there, you see my recommendations for the stabilizer type. And in that second window, you see my recommendations for the needle types. And then in the last window, you can see I have comments about how to handle that fabric. And it might be, um, you know, a tip on how to hoop it. It might be a tip on uh, some other aspect of of the oh you got one that you're going to shoot on camera yeah, so yeah. Eileen can show you there you just dial it to the fabric and in the you see the windows yeah that's how you see what I'm recommending and in most cases there's two or maybe even more sometimes I noticed when I was going through this for today sometimes I give three different stabilizer types there's not just one Right. work so so um, that's um, that's the compass so uh, let me just review some of the principles you know we talk about stabilizers all the time but needles are definitely a part of it too so I just want to tell you why I recommend specific point types and blade sizes on the compass most embroiderers use light ball point needles because that's typically what is sold as embroidery needles. They're light ball points. And you can see in this image that the ball point is simply a you know, blunter needle. Now, it's still sharp. I mean, if you, you can still prick your finger with it. It's a sharp needle, but it has a rounder point in, te in a technical sense. So there's reasons for these two point types. They don't just make a sharp and a ballpoint uh, for grins, there's a reason. So the ballpoint tip is really meant for uh, knits. It won't damage knits and the rounded tip is why. And however, it does not penetrate woven fabrics as cleanly as the sharp point. And you can tell that just by looking at this picture because there's a smaller footprint to the sharp point. So. Um, they just slide through easier. So here's the way you can uh, imagine this in your mind. You see how a ball point is intended to go between the interlocking yarns in a knit. However, and I don't want to scare you with this next image, but a sharp point needle can, can cut those yarns. And that can lead to the interlocking structure uh, being damaged. So I don't want to have you shy away from using sharp point needles because they're very uh, necessary for woven fabrics. But for knits, yeah, let's use that light ball point. <laughs> and we, we also need to use the right blade size because you don't want that um, needle getting deflected by the heavy uh, fabric in a, oh, let's say a, something canvas or something uh, like that. You want to have a heavier blade for the heavier fabrics. And of course, Eileen, as you know, we also use those finer blades, not just for finer fabrics, but also finer thread types, right? Absolutely. And you know, when we say deflect, you know, it all happens so fast, right, Deborah? Right, I mean, it's right. lightning speed. So it's not like you can see this happen. No. But because those fabrics are thick, 
you know, the needle just doesn't escape as quickly as it would on a lightweight fabric. So that's really where this deflection comes from, right? Because the right, and, and when it's deflected, as you can imagine, Eileen, it's hitting something that isn't normal for it to hit. In other words, right. it would be uh, maybe the hole in, uh, in the in the um, in the th needle plate, or it could be the hook assembly. It could be anything. So you don't want that happening, right? So we just want to go. That's one reason I include the needle in the uh, compass. And so uh, just be aware, ball points are for knits and sharps are for wovens. That's the good general rule. And, and I will say, Eileen, sometimes it doesn't matter like a towel doesn't matter if you use a ballpoint or a sharp. So the compass, uh, it points that out. You can use either kind. So that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now, of course, the next question is, which white stuff do I need? Of course, and we it all joke a lot of, just like white stuff, right? <laughs> we joke a lot of times about that, about how sometimes we say it all looks like toilet paper when it's just on the, these rolls. You know, it's not anything that that is distinctive about most of it. So you sometimes don't remember what purpose you bought a particular stabilizer type for. So let's just go over some of that. And by the way, you know, I see on Facebook all the time people substituting almost anything for stabilizers. They'll use paper towels, coffee filters. Uh, they use dressmakers interfacing for cutaway. Have you noticed that, Eileen? I have. And, you know, I, I don't comment because it opens just there's not enough time <laughs> <laughs> I know and, time. and and I don't either because you know the thing about it is that sometimes people uh that may be all they have at hand and and you know maybe it will will get them through a project but in general terms here's the reason why we don't do that uh as you can see there's a difference even between uh embroidery stabilizers that are not made as well as the uh, type that we sell. The type that, that, that uh, Dime has are wet laid stabilizers and you can see the uniform coverage you get with the distribution of the fibers in this type. Whereas I've got to got to say if you're buying your stabilizers uh from some random person on the internet you might be getting a a stabilizer that looks like the the one with the spotty coverage here and those tend to stretch and they tend to not give you proper coverage you may have to use multiple layers of those eileen that's right yep and this is one of those circumstances where okay it comes out of the hoop and looks decent but you give that gift and then, you know, your sister shows up in the shirt that you made her. And oh boy, it doesn't look like anything you intended it to do, right? That's right. That's the reason why better safe to have a high quality stabilizer. And, and you know, a high quality stabilizer is made out of usually a mixture of polyester, cellulose, and something to hold it all together, which we call binding agents. But dime stabilizers also contain some silicone in most of them to lubricate the needle, which of course is going to give you smoother stitching, fewer thread breaks. It's just a little added bonus that you get in, uh, in the dime stabilizers. So we have yeah. a couple of questions, Deborah. Yeah. Let me okay. interrupt. Linda Burke sure. wants to know that, well, she said someone once told her that tool works for stabilizer. Is that true or false? Well, what mostly I think is a good use for tool uh, is more like some people put it on top of a plush um, item. Um, like a towel, like a towel to to hold the yeah. nap down, and then they embroider, and it 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 keeps the embroidery on top of the tool. You know, uh, that's a, a, a an okay use for tool. I think it breaks a little too easily because you know when you use it for that purpose, Eileen, you know how easy it is to break it away it's from the, it away. Yeah. yeah, so it's not yeah. really a substitute for stabilizer. It's so, not no, really. No, it's not, not really. really. Now, now I will tell our view, our viewer. Uh, what's uh, what is her name? That's uh, Ju uh, Linda Burke. Linda. Oh, Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, Linda. <laughs> I, know, I, I know Linda. Uh, Linda, you know, uh, I will tell you, and this is something that is just an old timey uh, solution, and that is organza 
uh, a polyester organza does make a substitute, especially on bulky knits. If you've got a bulky knit where any colored stabilizer might show through like a white <laughs> or a black, uh, you could get a matching polyester organza and use it. And, and certainly that is um, something that, uh, that I've done and, uh, and sweaters, you know, sweaters are great done that way. So it's just something that deviates a little bit from, uh, from the traditional type of stabilizers. Well, you know, speaking of using organza, you know, because a color is a good reason to use organza can candy, Bra oh, my mice are getting mixed up. Candy Bray says, uh, does stabilizer come in black or dark? You know, <laughs> Yeah, sure it does. You know, it may it is in the more limited types in black, and and uh, that is uh, usually limited to uh, a couple of cutaways and and one way to tear away in most stabilizer lines. But yes, you can get it, and there's certainly reasons to use it. But it will be a little harder to find uh, because uh, people don't stock it as deeply as they do the white. Yeah. And then Patricia Reardon says lots of people use organza for freestanding lace. And, you know, I would agree with that, but I wouldn't use it only, you know, I would still definitely use my, so my wash away mesh right. stabilizer in conjunction with the organza. Right, right, right. And, uh, and I agree with that as well. Well, those are great questions. You know, I love it when we hear from, uh, from people about their, things that have worked for them as well as the questions so it's it's uh, yeah we have a couple more so okay. i don't want to forget them uh, but yeah. you go on and i'm going to write them down how about that okay that well that's fine it, it, however you want now so one thing that some people don't know is that there are two main types of tearaway firm and soft you may have had a tearaway at some point that you didn't like because you didn't feel it tore away as cleanly. Well, that probably was a soft tear away. A firm tear away tears like paper. It tears cleanly, whereas a soft tears more ragged. And that's because it has more polyester fiber in it and less cellulose. Now that may sound technical to you, but what it means is that it's a hybrid between cutaway and tear away. So here's what that means. If you look at this circle that was stitched with a firm tearaway, that breaks down, that firm tearaway breaks down after the fill stitches have been applied and there's nothing left to support the detail or the, the outline around that. So soft tearaway holds more stitches, holds up for the outline where firm is good for, you know, it's great for a lot of purposes. I use about 50% firm and about 50% soft. Now, if you look at this uh, heart, the, the outline didn't follow. That's because it was stitched with a crisp tearaway on a knit and the stabilizer broke down the outline off track, out of register, we call it sometimes. But if you look at this heart, stitched on the same pink knit, it was stitched with uh, either a cutaway or a soft tearaway. Because remember I said the soft tearaway is a hybrid between a cutaway and a tearaway. So when you see at your dealer's store something labeled as soft tearaway, just remember that's a more friendly tearaway that'll work so, uh, within some bounds on a knit. Now, a no-show cutaway is one of my favorites. You probably recognize it because it's got that embossed pattern on it. It's very soft. It has no stretch because it's nylon. And some people call it poly mesh, but it's actually not polyester. It is 100% nylon. So here's an image of a shirt with a lot of detail that was stitched with the no-show mesh. And one layer, as you can see in this picture, will work great if it is hooped well. I like this for smaller hoop sizes. Uh, some people use it for those in the hoop quilting projects. Uh, so it's, it's really a very versatile stabilizer. And if you're um, hooping it all the way in the hoop, it will support uh, this type of a detailed design and give you good 
registration or the outlines, meaning the outlines will stay on track. Now, when I get into bigger hoop sizes like this sweatshirt, I like to use a traditional non cutaway. For me, and my preference is rather than using a no show in this big hoop size for this uh, very dense, well, not a dense design, but a, a more stitch intensive design, heavier stitch count than could be held in a small hoop, I prefer to move over to the non woven cutaways for these types of design, they, these types of hoop sizes. So now caraway, when we use it on a very lightweight fabric, can show through unless you remove every little tiny piece. And that can get to be a little, you know, cumbersome to do, time consuming. So uh, I like to use a different solution to get no show through on these kinds of fabrics. Here's what I do. I hoop with the um, sewing heat. And I don't know where that word is, but sewing heat <laughs> should be up there. And sewing heat is a transparent film. It looks like water soluble, but it's not. It is a uh, heat soluble. And okay, sewing heat, there's my word. So uh, when I hoop it, I hoop with two layers of sewing heat to do something like this poem on this sheer handkerchief. Then I tear away those large pieces, just like you would do with your water soluble. Okay. And look, you see, it's clear. It's tr totally transparent. Then I, I iron the back of the piece. And as you can see, it turns out just beautifully. I don't have puckering and it even if there's the tiny pieces left inside some of those tiny little letters they do not show through so you don't have to worry about um, that issue so all of these kinds of solutions <clears throat> are included on the embroiderer's compass and i want to move over eileen to the camera and show some of these in real life uh examples okay. well before you go should we answer some questions oh sure let's do okay so Tracy Powell wanted to know, when are some good reasons to use sticky stabilizer? Well, you know, there are two types of sticky stabilizer that I use all the time. One is the peel and stick, which is just a sticky tear away. And then there is the adhesive sew and wash, which is a mesh type wash away. And I love it for things like, uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a kind of a pashmina, a loosely woven shawl over here that I did a detailed design on because that mesh is a little friendlier than the tearaway might be in that case. Um, so I use the, the self-adhesive tearaway peel and stick if there's something is too small to hoop, if it has a a physical limitation like a zipper <laughs> that I don't want to yeah. hoop, or if I don't have a magnetic hoop Eileen uh, if I didn't have a magnetic hoop I would not be able to hoop that uh, mm -hmm. in a traditional hoop and um, sometimes items that might be marred by a hoop uh, uh, you know I typically don't want to do uh, certain fabrics in a traditional hoop because I don't want them to be marked, right? Right. And, you know, Wendy uh, Hansen says, you know, what, what do you mean? You use, Deborah, you do use this term holding method. So what, what exactly do you mean by that? Right. Well, holding method is simply how we keep it uh, <laughs> under the embroidery machine, under the needle. So that could be anything from a magnetic hoop, a traditional hoop. It could be a uh, self-adhesive solution. So there are multiple uh, uh, holding solutions. Uh, so I don't always call it hooping because even... Uh, a snap hoop monster, for instance, to me is a magnetic, it is a magnetic hoop, but it's not a traditional hoop. So I like the term uh, holding uh, methods. Okay, very good. Nancy Taylor wants to know, well, we could, I could probably spin the dial, spin that, I don't have to spin the roulette wheel, but you know, 
What type of fabric and stabilizer would you use on athletic wear, like spandex, cotton, lycra, that kind of well, thing? <clears throat> well, we have th really, uh, you know, I, I recommend one of three different solutions for that. You could use a no-show. You could use a fusible no-show if you want, because that fusible no-show is going to keep you from stretching it as you're hooping it. But, you know, that is an interesting question, because listen to uh, uh, the two types of techniques you want to use hooping that. If it were going to be a pair of athletic shorts uh, that might be stretched over the body or a swimsuit or anything that you're going to stretch over the body, you actually want to give it a little bit of stretch when you're hooping it so that that creates ease. And, yeah. and so that is one method. But if it were going to be a gator, which a lot of us have become more familiar with gators in COVID, you know, but just the loose kind of uh, 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 knit that might, uh, 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 let's call it a uh, technical knit that might be pulled over and just be loose, then you don't stretch that when you hoop it. So you could use a no-show, a fusible no-show, we have a, a specialty stabilizer called um, uh, PolyPro Performance, which is made just for those types of fabrics. And we also have another one called uh, Stretchy Knit Stabilizer. <laughs> it doesn't get any more descriptive than that. And that is a woven fabric type of uh, stabilizer. And that's a great uh a great solution for moisture wicking shirts like all of our guys, our sons, our husbands, uh, yeah. our brothers like to wear right now. Absolutely. And then Celeste wants to know, what about iron on wash away? Do, I, do we have iron on wash away? I'm not mm. familiar with that product. I no. mean, not really. And, and I, and I, you know, we have an adhesive wash away, which for me, uh, you know, would fulfill that purpose unless I'm not thinking of a reason that you would need to <clears throat> iron it on. But either type would fuse or bond, I should say, to yes. the fabric being stitched. And, and of course, when it washes away, I'm going to show you on an example here in a minute how, how wonderful that can look. Now, personally, um, I've never found a reason to use anything other than the adhesive, but, um, you know, it, it is a good thing to adhere it because sometimes those fabrics you're using it with are uh, prone to shifting. You're right. And Risa Ranke, this is Ranke, I guess. Um, this is the million dollar question. Should I wash my quilting cotton before embroidering on it? On it? Normally, I don't wash fabrics before using them. Well, and normally neither do professional embroiderers. So, right. you know, when you uh, go into a big production facility <clears throat> like the ones that I used to manage, of course, <laughs> we're not going to wash those things before we embroider them. So it is possible to use stabilizer solutions that are going to keep those products uh, looking good for the life of the item without pre-washing. Now, Eileen, you may have a, a opinion on that where quilting fabrics are yeah. concerned. Well, you know, and there's just two schools of thought on that. Some people love, they purchase their, their quilt fabrics and they bring them home and launder them all. But I personally don't like to do that. I like the sizing that's in those fabrics. It makes a nice crisp, crisp seam. I feel that it's easier to handle. And then I love after I make the quilt and I have unwashed, right? There's, I have both of my top and back has not been washed, nor has my batting. And so when I put that finished quilt, in the washer and dryer, and it all shrinks a little bit and creates that loft. That's what makes that so homey, so beautiful. Just love that texture. So there's no right or wrong. Definitely, there's no right or wrong. Right. And you know what, Eileen? One time I did a test. <clears throat> you know those waffle towels that are, yes. you know, dish towels? I embroidered uh, one uh, that I pre-washed, and I embroidered one and then washed it. And even though that those have uh, a lot of uh, shrinkage in one direction, uh, mm -hmm. there was no you could not tell one from the other. So oh, I don't think it's, yeah, yeah. That's I don't think it's as important as sometimes we might guess. Yeah, a couple more questions. So Becky Berlin, and this is a great question. Some people recommend pre-shrinking the mesh stabilizers. So what's your take on that? 
Well, you know, the reason they do that is because the mesh stabilizer, the no-show type, is uh, nylon. That means it's heat sensitive. So you, what you, what, why they do that is to take that risk element away that it might shrink in the dryer or something like that. My personal preference is just not to expose those uh, heat sensitive stabilizers to a tremendous amount of heat. In other words, if I were going to iron that item, I guess I might pre-shrink it. But, you know, I'm not going to iron directly on my no-show stabilizer. So I've never had a an issue with that. But, of course, we have to use good judgment with any of these solutions for the moisture wicking shirts and that sort of thing. Because the Polypro Performance and the no-show are both, uh, you know, subject to uh, to you know, they, they should not be exposed to high heat. Let me high, put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, the highest setting in your dryer, you shouldn't do that. Just medium setting. Correct. Medium, you're fine. Right. And so then we have two questions, one from Pamela Harvey about baby wear and then Viola Prevetti, um, who wants to know what product is good to use on the back of a project that will be against the skin. And really these are to me, when anybody says baby wear, this is where I go. So what would you use to prevent those stitches from irritating the skin? Well, I use Fuso Soft, and I'll show you that in a moment on one of my onesies that I've done. And the re the difference between Fuso Soft, uh, which is made specifically for this purpose, and what some people sometimes characterize it as, which is a fusible trico. Yes, you could go to the fabric store and buy fusible trico, but it it the it, it, he, the uh, fusible on it is not as aggressive as what is on the one that's made for this purpose. So it'll last the life of the garment. I can show you that if you do it properly, there's no lifting and it'll stay on there. Uh, you know, is through the washing and wearing. Right. And, you know, that's what I use to finish my necklines when I like the boho oh, necklines and all of the ones that I've done with uh, Nancy Zeman. And, oh, my goodness, do I wash them? You know, they throw them <laughs> right in the washer and dryer and absolutely no problem. And it is very soft. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, Mindy Goodall has a, a question. Um, so she wants to know, Fred LeBeau used to uh, teach that cutaways shouldn't be used with wovens because they shrink. Was this more of an issue with older stabilizers or is it still an issue today? Actually, it's still an issue today, especially for me. I want to, you know, we all have our pet peeves and one of my pet peeves is seeing a cutaway on a woven. Uh, you know, Eileen, I learned this lesson very well. I know I've told you the story with the, my silk charmeuse uh, that I was working with uh, and I was determined to put a drapey stabilizer with it. I wanted to use that no-show. And I said, and it puckered. And so I said, oh, I know what I did wrong. I need to use fusible no show. And it puckered. And when I got back to basics and I used a tearaway, no puckering. So, uh, you know, I agree with Fred LeBeau cutaways and, uh, and woven fabrics really are not the best marriage. You know, those woven fabrics. Uh, do best with a tearaway, and and we do have different weights of tearaway uh, to handle different types of wovens. But absolutely, and you know, tearaways are one stabilizer I will layer. You know, uh, if if I prefer a a to use two layers of light. Sometimes I do that instead of one medium, you know, because it will stress the stitches less as I remove those light uh, uh, layers one at a time. So uh, that, in fact, sometimes on the compass, I, I say, you know, one or more layers because only with tearaways, though, I don't really do that with a cutaway. A cutaway, we should choose the correct weight for the fabric. And usually my general rule is my stabilizer should not be heavier than the fabric I'm applying it to. I like uh, that as a, I like that as a guideline for sure, mm -hmm. because you never really want to change the hand of a fabric. Right. So, right. you know, here's a, another million dollar question. Debbie Williams is puckering around a design caused by poor hooping or the wrong stabilizer. It could be either, you know, um, certainly if it's a knit, it can be caused by hooping because if that knit has been stretched during the hooping, the yarn wants to recover back to its original position and that can create 
puckering around the design. And, you know, I'll tell you a, a tip. Uh, if that happens on a knit and it's not extreme, if it's just slight puckering because it was stretched during hooping, you know what I've done, Eileen, is put that knit over an ironing board, over the end of an ironing board, stretched it out a little bit and ironed on some Fuso Soft because that will hold those puckers out if they're not yeah. too extreme. That, that's a great tip. Absolutely. Love that. Okay. Well, you promised to show us samples and I promised to stop asking you questions. So let's oh, keep that's okay. Interrupt <laughs> anytime with a question. So I'm going to move over to the camera, Eileen. Okay. Sounds good. <clears throat> and our, we have fixed the shopping cart. So that special is up. Someone had mentioned, you know, they, uh, it wasn't in the cart available at that special price. So it is now for sure. So please take advantage of that. If you don't have a compass yet, because boy, I would, I couldn't embroider without it. I use it all the time for sure. And bonjour, Kathy well, from France. Lovely to have you here. We understand you're in lockdown now again. So we even have curfews at night. Oh, so embroider, God. right? Be happy in your sewing room. Okay, Deborah, show us well, what this, you have there. Well, this first example is what I was talking about with the sewing heat. So this is a very sheer handkerchief you know it's 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 very lightweight in fact i don't know if you the I, light, you can see my hand. Hand. Oops. we have an echo okay and so if i uh let you see the back of it you don't see any trace of stabilizer and i use two layers of the sewing heat and as you look at the front no puckering so that's you, that's beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful gift item. And now, of course, notice I didn't fill in the butterfly, Eileen, completely, right? Because we have to use a little bit of judgment doing these lightweight fabrics. And so uh, just like we wouldn't use a stabilizer that's heavier than the fabric, let's not use a design that changes the hand of it either, if, where we can avoid it. And, and you know, that's just as lovely, I think, as, as it would be with a heavier. Now, with a heavier design. Now here's an example of a shirt that I have embroidered and washed and worn for many seasons. <laughs> and uh, you may recognize this design, Eileen, if it's from a lovely set. And look at the back, you can see I used a tearaway and you can see a little bit of it left there in the handle of the cup. And that's all that's there, but you don't see puckering here. So my um, uh, point is that this is a, a, a full coverage design. Let's call it full coverage, not dense, because certainly the density is very soft, very appropriate. Okay, so it's not dense, but it is full coverage. And I just used, a, it appears, a single layer of the proper weight tearaway. So don't be afraid of tearaways on your uh, on your wovens. I think it, it has served me well on this piece, which has been washed and worn for, for years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, here's another woven type that can be tricky. And that is a um, nylon or polyester windbreaker. Okay. So this is a example of both using a tearaway stabilizer and that sharp point needle. You know, you if I had used a ballpoint needle on this, I possibly would have gotten a bit of puckering. And as you can see on the back, the tearaway. So it's it's just a tearaway application. And this, as you know, is one of the high tendency to pucker. <laughs> yes, those nylon jackets are very challenging to embroider on. And they're often requested from family members, right, Deborah? Absolutely, they sure are. Now, this is what I meant about a, a towel, a terry cloth towel. You don't have to be worry about the needle so much. Uh, the needle would be okay um, either with a uh, sharp or ballpoint. But you do want to uh, think about maybe a tear and wash with this type of a, of a design. But again, you see how full coverage, 
And in fact, uh, you know, our user that used the Mylar in her window, she, she, she probably can't tell on this, but I've got a bit of Mylar under this flower. So. Yeah, we can see the shimmer for sure. And that yeah. fringe in the center is gorgeous. Oh, uh, yeah. I love, I love fringe just like you do, Eileen. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I wonder how many of our viewers like fringe. Do you like fringe? Fringe, let us know in the comments. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great take. If you've never done it, it is one of the most fun. Uh, when I do live events, you know, boy, people love pulling that fringe uh, to the top. So, it kind yeah. of looks like a hot mess. And then, you know, suddenly it's gorgeous, right? Exactly. You're, you're yeah. so right. Now, this is that pashmina I mentioned earlier, and it is a loosely woven fabric. So for this, instead of a it is a woven and instead of a tearaway i used that adhesive um sewing wash which is a mesh type and when i uh, wash it away there's absolutely no residue left around the edges but i got the firm support of that mesh while it was being embroidered so and of course um eileen i did use the nap blocker uh oh. on this to because it was on that busy surface, I thought it would, you know, give a little, uh, little shadow of a border around it. So, yeah, very nice. And of course, um, I guess I'll, I'll. Here's another, um, another woven. I don't know that it's going to show good under the camera. It's kind of big, but this is a pillow. And the reason that I like the uh, tearaway on this, if I had a cutaway and and this this pillow form underneath it. Eileen, you know, that, um, that edge, that sh the, it, the cutaway would definitely show through something that's got a pillow form in it, right? Yes, it, it would. You'd have this outer, you know, ring kind of around your embroidery that is not very desirable for sure. Right. So here I have those, that design I showed you um, in two different shirts. This one was used with a traditional cutaway. This one has the no-show. But you get the same result, really, the similar result. Neither has puckering. So depending on your experience level, if you're not that confident in your hooping yet, you could certainly use a light traditional cutaway. You're going to get the same type of result, but with a little bit, a um, little friendlier uh, stabilizer uh, until you get your your hooping technique down. You know, Eileen, that's a skill, right? Yes, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, this is a onesie that I did. Now, this is a popular little saying it, when you go to craft fairs and that sort of thing. I'll have a bottle of the house white with the baby bottle. And of course, I embroidered this with a no-show and, and we see that we don't have the puckering and a, a fairly uh, full coverage design here in the baby bottle. So don't be afraid of that no-show. And then on the back, I added the Use So Soft. And this um, is a good uh, illustration that you don't get any lifting. Now you want to round it, uh, not have square corners. And some people like to cut cut it with the pinking shears, Eileen, so that that helps um, make it more invisible, let's say. I, I often use the pinking shears too. I, I just, you know, have them. I don't use them. You know, why not? It's a good use for them, right? Exactly. And this is um, another use. I do my socks on, here's a couple. I do my socks on um, adhesive sewing wash. You know, it's a, it is a really good solution where you want more support uh, and yet you don't want any during embroidery, but you don't want anything left, you know, after the stabilizer is right. removed. It is removed completely. Mm -hmm. There is no no border around this, but that adhesive sewing wash is, is a great solution for uh, socks and little items that we do want to stick down. So lastly, I'm going to show you this act here is the Einstein sweatshirt and I'm going to show you of course you see it still looks great on the front I wear this all the time and well not all the time but I wear it frequently <laughs> and it, it's it, in the in the popular rotation right that's right that's right for this winter it was 
And if we if we take a peek at the back, you can see that it is a little bit more of this this uh, traditional type stabilizer. It, you can see that it has been washed many times, but it still is doing its job. And that's the whole point. And it's soft to wear. I'm feeling this right now. And it is very soft. And of course, when I wear it, it is, is really fine. So the main point I'm making is that over, you know, a couple of years that I've been wearing this shirt, it still looks great. And there's, there's no issue with even after washing and wearing, uh, it's going to maintain. So when you're giving something like this as a gift, you want it to look great forever, right? I mean, Absolutely. I mean, you know, it would just break your heart if you saw that on someone that you gave it to being worn after several washings and it was all puckered or wrinkled or, you know, stitches. Right. Well, there's no real registration outlines on this uh, embroidery design, but many have that. And it's very frustrating to uh, see that not aligned. Right. Right. You know, I guess after a couple of years, I really should trim that jump stitch on the eye, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you didn't have to call that out. Oh, my goodness. We didn't even see it. That's we're, our own, we're our own worst critics, aren't we, Eileen? Oh, we are our own worst critics, and we shouldn't do that. Definitely shouldn't do that. <laughs> Well, it's been really fun showing uh, some of the things that I enjoy, not just embroidering, but also using day to day. You know, that's one of my uh, uh, favorite decorative items, my my little pillow and a couple of my favorite shirts to wear. So, you know, this is something that really is helpful when you embroider embroider some things that you keep and wear and use so that you know that your embroider your stabilizer solutions are are appropriate that's right so mary um caskey wants to know what stabilizer did you use on that sweatshirt with the dog on einstein i used a, a medium uh, cutaway just a regular you know you just and that's the great thing about um the you know the reason I used a medium is because it is a medium weight fabric. So mm -hmm. had it been on a t-shirt, I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't put something quite that heavy. But if I did, <clears throat> if I did do a full front t-shirt, I would use a light cutaway. On this, I used the medium because it is a heavier fabric. Okay, and someone says that font was gorgeous. Shaza says the font on Einstein is gorgeous. Oh, and then yeah, is that Bajas? It is something in our uh, per, 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 uh, Perfect Embroidery Pro, for yeah. sure. I'm not yeah. sure which one it is, to be honest. I'd have to go look. But, yeah. but it, you know, that's the software I use day to day for everything. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Wendy Hansen wanted to know, what, some people use multiple layers of stabilizer. When and why would you do this? You, you kind of hit a couple points, but maybe answer one, that. One that we didn't hit on yet is to get the qualities of multiple types of stabilizer for the same uh, item. So let's say we wanted to do something with a a heavier design on a fabric that we wanted to use, let's say, a no-show on. Mm -hmm. I can often float a piece of uh, tearaway to get that property, you know, of the crispness to hold outlines or to hold the, the stitches uh, from pulling in. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a reason sometimes we make a stabilizer sandwich to get the properties of two different stabilizers in the same embroidery. And, you know, another reason, <laughs> this is, this is, this is another tip. If you are embroidering something like a pillowcase, okay, and you, and it's a lightweight woven and you see it starting to pucker while it's on the machine, well, you know, it's not going to get any better when you get it off the machine. It's only going to get <laughs> worse when you unhook it, right, Eileen? Yeah. <laughs> so the time no how much training you do doesn't work. God really has more important things to do than worry about what's in your hoop. So, you know, what I do is I'll slide a piece of light tear away. I'll stop the machine, slide a piece of light tear away under there, and if and turn the machine back on, see if it stops the puckering. And I'll even do it a second time if necessary, because during that 
stitching time is an, is the time to add another layer because it's tear away. You're going to remove it, you know. Right. And so uh, it, I like to only do that, though, with the light tear away. And that's one reason why I always keep light tear away in my mm -hmm. uh, studio so that I can use it to combat uh, puckering issues at the machine if needed. And so Judy says, well, can you, she says, can too many layers of stabilizer be used? So well, sure. You know, you don't want it to be, uh, you know, I've seen professionally embroidered uh, garments. Uh, I remember one time when moisture wicking shirts first came out, uh, mm. there was a famous brand that had embroidery on the sleeve and I wanted to see what stabilizer they use. So I turned the sleeve inside out and it had three layers of heavy cutaway. <laughs> so certainly they were trying to uh, combat the puckering, which that is a difficult fabric, but they used too much stabilizer. It, it, it affects the aesthetics of the wearing. Yes. And then Mary Larson just kind of has a two part question here. She says, do you always use a floater piece of stabilizer? No, in fact, I don't use it unless it's necessary. You know, I, I am a, a believer in hooping or holding your stabilizer with the fabric and, mm -hmm. and only floating as a supplement. And then she, her second question is um, when you use multiple layers of floater pieces, do you place them at different angles because of the weave? Well, the reason stabilizer as a non-woven, uh, it doesn't have a, a grain, okay, or a weave. So, so the reason that people used to recommend using multiple layers and putting them at opposing angles was to minimize stretch in, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the stabilizers. That <clears throat> isn't necessary when you, now the reason they had stretch isn't because they had a grain, it's because they had poor fiber coverage like I showed you in that earlier slide. So when you're using a high quality stabilizer, it isn't necessary to put them at opposing angles or even right. to use multiple layers. Okay. And then Carmen wants to know, well, she's just, you know, sharing her pain that she gets puckering after washing her towels and tea towels and some knit t-shirts. Well, we right, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, it is a matter of, uh, of testing, you know, try, try a different solution. And, and honestly, you know, it is very frustrating when you uh, do something that came out very very much to your liking and then you wash it and you get that puckering you know so and and those are woven well the, the tea towel is woven right mm -hmm. so uh, so you know if if that happens you know i would say maybe use a little heavier weight tear away okay to to support those stitches because remember you know the the towel has to support those stitches after the stabilizer is removed okay mm -hmm. so so also look at your design yeah, and yeah. Carmen, I, I think for Carmen, it, that might be a good instance where, especially with the t-shirts, if you have that puckering to then apply the fuse so soft on the wrong side of the garment, you know, place right. it embroidery side down on the ironing board and kind of give it a little smush out, right? With your hands, smooth yep. it out to remove it, those puckers it, and add that few so so. It, it really works as long as the puckering isn't really extreme, you know, and, yeah. and it's a great feeling when you can recover uh, something like that. Yeah. And then Linda Burke wants to know, uh, does pre-shrinking pre the towel or t-shirt prevent that? Well, it, it might if if shrinkage is the issue, but in my experience, usually it's a different uh, reason. It's either uh, improper stabilizer or uh, too dense of a design for the fabric or another reason. Usually pre-shrinking, like I said, I, I've pre-shrunk and not pre-shrunk and gotten basically the same result uh, on, on, uh, on those waffle weave towels. So I right. think that, I think that that kind of illustrates that it's more a matter of choosing, uh, the appropriate stabilizer and Eileen in your quilting, you know, I love the fact that, uh, that you let it all take shape together at the end and wash it all after it's been right. assembled. I think that that kind of is a, a neat, 
uh, idea too. So generally, I think uh, pre-washing is uh, not going to hurt anything, but uh, it, it. I like the sizing as well that comes in and things. When I give a gift, honestly, I don't want it to be pre-washed. I want it to have that sizing in there so it looks brand new. Yeah. Right, exactly. Now, Viola wants to know, is peel and stick stabilizer hard on your needle? Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, 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 technically it's a tearaway. And so tearaways are a little harder on your needle in general than a, uh, than a cutaway because they have more cellulose. And remember, that's what paper's made out of. So it's kind of like sewing through paper. So any tearaway is hard on your needle, uh, to be to be frank. So you want to remember that uh, and change your needle fairly frequently. Um, so yes, but the, it's not the adhesive that's hard on it. <laughs> it's the substrate, the tearaway. Right, right. And Risa wants to know, uh, do you have any hints to get the tear away out of those tiny areas or is it okay to just leave it? Leave oh, it. I leave it. Oh, I leave it. Listen, those tiny areas you saw on some of my examples, like the handle on the teacup and so forth, I right. do not take it out because honestly, if I did, the, the, the item will have less support. So I don't mind leaving it in there. It's not, a, a, to me, a, a negative at all. Right. But, you know, in a sheer fabric, that's when you would use the heat away or something in that fashion right. because you don't want any of it visible. But, you know, also Remember, Risa, embroiderers are so hard on themselves. You give a gift like that that has some of the tear away, like in the teacup opening, and that person, the recipient, is not an embroiderer. It doesn't even dawn on them that possibly that little piece of white could be removed. Really. Right. I learned that at when, you know, all the 20 some years that I ran the magazine, every time we would go to a photo shoot, we'd bring all these beautiful embroidered projects and to the team at the photography studio who nobody embroiders there. And what they would ooh and ah over, you know, where I'm cringing like, oh, if they see the inside of that garment, you know, and they're like, ah, so believe me, that was a good thing to learn from them. All right, let's see. Then one more question from Becky Berlin. She wants to know, are there any guidelines about how to know if a design is dense or just covers? Well, you know, <clears throat> you know, yes, I think so. I think there's many indicators that a design's too dense. One of them is, is uh, thread breakage. Of course, that can also be too, sh too short of a stitch length, but but thread breakage is one. I try to roll my design. If I, when I roll a design in my hands, it should be only slightly heavier than the fabric that it's applied to. Just like that shirt with the bird on the teacup. I mean, that is barely perceptibly heavier than that chambray fabric that it's applied to. You know, uh, big, heavy design. I mean, even my Einstein design, it's very not, not appreciably heavier than the fabric. So, you know, there are uh, densities that are appropriate for certain fabric types. That's why any of you who've ever ordered a custom design, you tell the digitizer what fabric it's going to be applied to because that kind of should really govern the uh, the density of the right. stitches being applied to it. Right, Eileen? Yeah, and you know, our perfect embroidery pro that Deborah and I both use to embroider and digitize, we use all like for every day we're in it. It has settings in there that where I can literally go and I can digitize the design and say, I'm going to stitch this on a tissue knit, you know, really lightweight baby knit fabric and a sweatshirt. And it'll give me two different versions. Of course, I have to save them under a new name. But and it adjusts all that density for that fabric, which is wonderful. Well, yeah. Deborah, you were delightful. Again, I always learn from Deborah, always learn from Deborah. I know many of you have. And, you know, I just want to share this one comment from uh, Shazia in South Africa. She says that she's learned so much from both of us uh, through Crapsy. They are a gem all the way from South Africa. So uh -huh. thank you for those kind words. And I know that I love what I do. And so do you. Right, Deborah? Absolutely. And, you know, Eileen, uh, I know both of us love to share what we've learned because we 
as embroiderers, you know, we learn through trial and error. And certainly I've made plenty of errors that, that taught me uh, uh, how to make these selections. And that's why I like to, to share it. So other people can, uh, you know, be more successful the first time. <laughs> I agree. You know, you have when you get into machine embroidery, you just have to accept you're going to make a lot of ugly embroidery in the beginning. It's just part of life, right? Right. Exactly, Eileen. Well, it's been fun to be here, and it's and I certainly uh, love the seeing the small town charm samples from from the followers, and and really uh, hope to see more next uh, next week. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for watching. And remember, you can watch the rebroadcast if you missed any of the tips. Otherwise, we'll see you here next week, same time, one o'clock. Bye.